Welcome to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob, where you'll hear highly accomplished and fascinating guests talk about the challenges they've overcome and the winning mindsets that have led them to great success. And now your host, Dr. Bob. Welcome to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. My guest today is Matthew Lohmeyer. Matthew graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 2006. He holds two master's degrees, one in military art and science and the other in military strategy. Clearly, he's not a lightweight. Following his graduation, he served in various capacities in the Air Force for the next 15 years, rising to the rank of lieutenant colonel. In 2020, he was assigned to the U.S. Space Force, where he was appointed to be the commander of the 11th Space Warning Squadron, responsible for tracking and reporting on missiles launched around the world against the U.S. and its allies. His impressive career took a sudden and unexpected change after he made comments during a podcast And that was about worrisome changes that he saw occurring in the military. That podcast is still posted on Rumble, and I just listened to it today. In that podcast, Matthew discusses a book that he had just completed entitled Irresistible Revolution, Marxism's goal of conquest and the unmaking of the American military. That book contains more than 50 pages of well-documented examples of radical political activity that is condoned in the military today. Activity that in the past would be considered subversive because it undermines the belief that America is worth fighting for. Then on May 14th, just one week, one week after that podcast, Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Lohmeyer was relieved of his command and terminated from the Air Force. Today, you're going to hear details of his incredible story and about his continued efforts to help awaken America to the real and present dangers that are happening every day to undermine our society. Matthew, you're an exceptionally courageous man. I'm delighted to meet you and to welcome you to the show today. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Happy to be here. Well, what did you see happening in the Air Force that led you to writing this book? Most people in the country um, certainly watch the news with concern, particularly in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd. Uh, We saw rioting, looting, what you might call typically social justice activism. And indeed, that was concerning uh, and the lack of accountability for that behavior oftentimes. And you saw something similar occurring, unfortunately, within our armed forces as well. Uh, people, you know, our young people, they're on social media, they're on Twitter and TikTok and whatever the other social media platforms are. And they tend to parrot the things that they see there. And they saw a lot of slogans, one-liners that, that purported to explain the world in which they lived. And you saw a lot of narratives about how systemically racist our country was, about how evil its founders were, and even denigrating Uh, our founding philosophy and our founding documents, the Constitution and the Declaration. And our service members, of all people, actually started to get caught up in that. And I don't think that that would have been possible had it not been for the fact that there were even certain senior leaders in uniform from uh, a position of authority while in their official capacity using their platform to push a a left-wing political agenda. Uh, and at my base in particular, where I happened to be stationed and where I was in command, uh, I had uh, an activist uh, base leadership. And uh, they seized that opportunity to start uh, what we would call diversity and inclusion trainings, hmm. what we would call race dialogue. Uh, but what that looked like in practice was uh, propaganda, I'll call it propaganda videos that were sent out from the base commander to all of the uniformed service members at the base and saying, hey, before next week's down day where we're gonna be discussing racial tensions in our country, 
please watch this video from Amazon Prime, this video from, from Netflix, or these videos from YouTube and read this article. And I paid very close attention to what was coming out. I watched it all, read it all to make sure I understood what was being fed to the young men and women who served in uniform under my command. And what I noticed that the was that the New York Times 1619 project narrative was prevalent. It was very anti-American. And frankly, it was uh, it was denigrating of the very values that you find in the in America's founding philosophy that cause our service members to want to serve in uniform in an all voluntary force. If you love your country, you believe in what it stands for, then you want to potentially even lay put some skin in the game, lay your life down for the cause, uh, and in defense, as you know, our oath is to the Constitution. When you start to hear that your country is evil, when you start to hear from later on the Secretary of Defense even, uh, that we have a terrible white nationalism and racism problem within the ranks, uh, which is totally false, by the way, uh, and even some four-star generals and admirals have testified before Congress to that effect, that they've never known a single white supremacist in, in uniform. Uh, and when you, when you start to hear that kind of belittling... It, 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 let me interrupt for a second. Yeah. <clears throat> Isn't the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff black? The Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Defense is sorry. black. That he's a retired four star. Mm -hmm. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs is not black. Uh, he's white. General Mark Milley, okay. um, Chief Staff of the Air Force is black. Uh, but, in it, fact, but we're in, the, but there's incipient racism throughout the military. Yeah, despite them. incidentally, uh, you know the la three out of the last four base commanders that I had uh, in mm -hmm. Colorado were black. Three out of the last four mm -hmm. colonels. These are you don't you don't become a base commander unless you're well, there's different ranks, but at that base, a colonel. Um, so most of the American people, frankly, in my opinion, are aware that a lot of those narratives were ideologically driven. They're, they're uh, rooted in Marxist ideology. If you've studied uh, the Marxist lineage of ideas at all, uh, and I had in the Defense Department's premier strategy school, uh, which, is, which is called SAS, the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies, uh, which... Uh, in fact, you read a book a day at that school. Uh, you'd think you can't learn much reading a book a day, but you can learn a great deal if you spend your entire year reading. And I, I, I peeled off during our studies about the Cold War to pay particular attention to Marxist ideology, Marxist revolutions, communism. <clears throat> and I, I felt like after reading the Communist Manifesto a few times and reading other Department of Defense manuals from during the Cold War about Marxist revolutions, I had a pretty good feel... I'll call it, I gained a good sniffer. I could sniff out the BS and the Marxist ideology when I saw it. And I show up at this base as a commander and every, all of the talking points that were coming from base leadership and even from senior military leaders in the form of diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings had a Marxist lineage. It's rooted in the critical school of thought. It's rooted, rooted in postmodernism. And it's a century old in this country. And so I, I started to notice that and I, I started without invitation, having young service members show up in my office expressing that they were losing their desire to serve their country. It's the very outcome you'd expect if people are being taught that their country is a terrible place. Uh, I had an Asian male come into my office and say he is determined to get out in a year following his active duty service commitment because it had become clear to him that to the Defense Department, everything's about the black and white divide. I had a, mm -hmm. a young... Native American female, uh, very well accomplished in her military career. In fact, come sit down in my office and express her dismay at all of our talk about race. And she was concerned that moving forward, if she was ever promoted again, or if she ever received any kind of accolade for anything, it might be because she was a female minority. I had a black female in my office. Again, this is all unsolicited. She came and sat down and said, I was never raised to believe this way. But since learning from the base commander and the chaplain at this base, I've learned that I'm an outsider in my country and in, in the uniform. And as a commander who loves these people a great deal and who cares about doing our mission, this was all you needed to hear to have all of the alarm bells going off. I was The alarm bells were going off when I saw it coming down. But to hear these young people now sensing that there, there was this growing division because Marxism, the oppressor versus the oppressed narrative, uh, that's frankly as old as time, but uh, its most recent iteration ideologically was in the Communist Manifesto in 1848 from Marx and Engels. 
that narrative is intended to cause divisions, groups of people, tribalism, that gets people so emotionally, viscerally entangled in a cause that they're willing to eventually cause, inflict violence upon one another. And this was taking place in our, in our armed forces, and it was wrecking our morale, it was wrecking good order and discipline. So I started to speak up, and uh, I shared it with my chain of command. I filed a formal complaint all the way up to the top. A formal complaint? I, I filed, well, I, I had <clears throat> and what, one, what did I, the complaint say? Well, so I had formal conversations with my immediate supervisor at the base, mm -hmm. expressing concern, with which he agreed and that there was a big problem. And now my immediate supervisor was also no six. Uh, the base commander was not in my chain of command, who was pushing out all of this propaganda. Mm. My immediate supervisor said, uh, I've tried to give feedback to this person before, and it's not well received. So think twice if you want to go give this person feed direct feedback. That was, that was my feedback from this guy. So mm -hmm. I continued to elevate until I finally talked with the senior most leader in the Space Force, uh, who's a good man, and I respect and him And of course, a before you went to the second level, you got permission. Well, yeah. There, I, in fact, I know all of them. And um, I've always been delicate how I talk about what I'm going to say next because I respect the man. He's in a tough spot. Uh, but the, the leader of the Space Force, I mean, I've, I've got, I, I texted with, I've texted with him plenty because we traveled the world together. I, I texted him one day and I said, hey, I've got a serious problem unfolding at this base that I would like to talk with you about. Instantly, he got back to me and says, hey, I'll be free at this time tonight. Let's talk about it. So we spent some time on the phone. And I said, I'd like to share with you what the life, a day in the, in the life of a commander at this base has been like for the last 24 hours. So you can hear what your young service members are saying at the, grass, at the ground level. You need to hear this because you're too far removed from what their day-to-day -day is like. So I related to him some of what I'm expressing to you, the, the division that was occurring. Whites walking down the hall, blacks walking down the hall, and there was this newfound skepticism of one another because they were being taught that there was people out to get one another. Uh, all from the chaplain, from the base commander, from the videos we were watching, and from our down days where we'd sit and have conversations about this stuff. All left-wing politicized talking points, by the way. And do you believe and, and this was only at your base or no, other no. bases? Well, so I wondered. So yeah, I, I yeah. knew that it was certainly proliferating rapidly at my base, but then I saw videos coming from senior Air Force leaders, the chief of staff of the Air Force, the uh, who, who said he's always had to work twice as hard as his white counterparts uh, to, to get places. He's, he's the guy with, he's the senior ranking officer in the Air Force, for crying out loud. Uh, and he's complaining. And he's essentially uh, <clears throat> carefully complaining about, you know, the, the image as a black airman that he has had to deal with. And I can't pretend to know everyone's circumstance, but he also had, uh, there was a chief master sergeant of the Air Force, the senior enlisted leader of the Air Force, who also happened to be black, who was very well respected. And in the aftermath of George Floyd's death, he was pushing out official videos in uniform to all of the service members, feeding this very impulse that I'm talking to you about. He, was, he said, every time I see the police lights light up in my rearview mirror, I'm afraid I'm going to be the next George Floyd. You don't say that in uniform to your serv service members, teaching them that the police are evil. That's just not true. And uh, he even said, uh, I'm a black man first. I just happen to be an airman. So there's this introduction of identity politics into, yep. the, into the military. So yeah. from, from the bottom up, people are parroting what they're seeing in their social media. And from the top down, our senior military leaders were enabling activism. And they were becoming, they were turning activists themselves. Uh, even, uh, it didn't matter their race, essentially. There were people of, of any race all jumping in into the fray, saying things like... <clears throat> We need to start having really serious conversations on how we can fix the white supremacy and, and racism problem we have in our ranks. Never in a uniform of saying, well, I've been in 25 years. I didn't know we had a mm -hmm. racism problem mm -hmm. in the ranks. It didn't matter. It never did matter. If you had a black commander and you were white or you had a white commander and you are black, we wore the same uniform. We did the same mission. It didn't matter. It never has. Military has been very good about that kind of thing. So I had this conversation with the senior leader of the Space Force, and he thanked me profusely and said, this, is, this has got to stop. You can't be having that kind of thing take place. He admitted. Oh, I, I misheard you. I heard you say, this is good stuff. What this, he oh, said yeah. is, this <laughs> got to stop. You know, so this is, yeah, the senior military leader said, we're thankful for your feedback. This has got to stop. That can't be happening.
They agreed with me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So up and down the ranks, they they agreed with me. But nothing. It seemed, despite the rank that these men wear on their shoulder, they're not able to change the the current of energy that was sweeping he across. He American. couldn't call the base commander into his office and and lay it down and say, "This is what you've been doing. This is wrong. I'm going to right. you know, I'm going to take away this from you, or or you're going to be penalized." Okay. He, he well, could have done that, right? He, he could have. And he should do have done it. Right. In fact, and he wasn't the direct supervisor for that boss. There was a three-star who was the direct boss, and he should have been the one that did it. He should have mm. called him right up and said, now we're going to get to that too. But he should have done that because it could have stopped it at that base. Right. That base commander would have probably got right in line, and that would have ceased at the base mm. for a season. Yeah, I, I <laughs> but the it. president of the United States instead was the one that stepped in. Mm -hmm. Trump on 22 September issued an executive order to all federal agencies, and he said critical race theory vocabulary should not be spread about in our diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings across the federal agencies and in our uniformed services. And then he shares in that executive order a, a whole bunch of examples of how this was showing up everywhere in federal agencies. That was the first news to me. That it's not just my base. This is showing up everywhere. The president of the United States had to issue an executive order to snuff this stuff out. And I start calling friends who are commanders at other bases. Sure enough, depends on the base. But this was showing up everywhere. I mean, it was a it was a national impulse. The seeds of Marxism had been planted for many years mm -hmm. in the universities and throughout American society. And once you once you watered it, I mean, it all sprung up like weeds all over the place. And our uniform services weren't exempt. So I filed a formal complaint with the Inspector General's Office of the Space Force, and I thought, if you put this in writing and lay out the illegal discrimination that's taking place, and there's a lot that I've never shared publicly. We had, civil, we had government civilians standing by ready to share witness to the discrimination that was taking place at our base if you were white. Mm -hmm. it was a, mm -hmm. from, the, from the black base commander, calling them into their office and saying, what's wrong with this picture? It was a picture of President Trump and his cabinet. They're all white. That's what's wrong with this picture. This is what the base commander is telling his civilian employees. He's giving homework to his civilian employees to go watch YouTube videos about the systemic racism problems we face in the country, about how the country wasn't really founded in this the 70s. This is dangerous. This is a base commander who's dangerous. now a one-star general. So I filed a formal complaint. I'll get to the end of this story in just one one minute. Uh, and this is a very long answer no to rush. an opening No question. rush. This is but very This is important. important. This is important. And I've never quite had the opportunity to connect all of the dots because I could talk for eight hours about it. I filed a complaint in November after the executive order had been issued by the president because it didn't stop the activism at my base. An executive order from the president. It's enough to get, it should get someone fired if they continued to act in a manner contrary to the executive order of the commander in chief. Yes, you'd hope so. You'd hope so. <clears throat> I filed a complaint and the three-star general who fields that complaint sat on it in November after the election and in December and in January and didn't interview the people, the 24 witnesses on the base that I had listed on my complaint. <clears throat> and January 6 happens, the supposed insurrection. January 7th, I get a written response saying what it was effectively the dismissal of my complaint. And the same day, the guy that's the base commander was promoted to one star. So they, to me, there was a climate of fear that caused military senior leaders to fail to act and hold some, someone who is an activist accountable, who also happened to be up for promotion to general officer. And I didn't know that at the time that I wrote my complaint. <clears throat> and you also, you also had the military senior leaders playing a waiting game, watching what the political writing on the wall was going to be. Mm -hmm. Who's the next president going to be? Because if it's Trump, we're going to hold this guy accountable. Mm -hmm. If it's Biden, then this is going to be CRT on steroids, and we're not going to have our heads roll for holding this base commander mm -hmm. accountable Responsible. for his activism, right? right? So he's promoted, <clears throat> and I'm left to think, as a commander, what am I to do to preserve the morale of my arm, of my troops? So I wrote a book, and that's the book that you mentioned, Irresistible Revolution. Uh, and the, the, the subtitle, Marxism's Goal of Conquest and the Unmaking of the American Military, not only is not an overstatement, but it was necessarily provocative because people have to pay, the, pay attention and wake the hell up. That's, that's, that's what that subtitle is about. And it also got me fired. I didn't think it would get me fired so quick. 
Before they could even crack the book and read what was inside, they fired me because they're afraid of what was inside. Mm -hmm. And and rightly, it's embarrassing what's inside. It's mm -hmm. it shows that there's a bunch of radical left wing activism sweeping across the military academies from West Point to Annapolis to the Air Force Academy, uh, and it's very much so Marxist, revolutionary, ideologically driven rhetoric mm -hmm. to at the ground level with our our young service members. So I sh I share all of that in the book, but I also do the reader a favor and actually teach them a little bit about Marxism, actually quite a bit about Marxist ideology in the process hoping that if we can educate ourselves and other people too can become courageous and realize they too need to speak up. Now, I'm, I'm sure you took careful steps when, when you did that uh, podcast. You weren't in uniform. You weren't speaking as lieutenant Correct. colonel. And what about when you wrote the book? Uh, were you careful? Did, you knew the rules. Uh, did you break any rules? Thanks for asking that. Yeah, so to my knowledge, I did not break any rules. Uh, to this day. In fact, I deliberately read and studied the rules and tried to make sure I kept them. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, legally and otherwise, public affairs. Uh, so I, ca I called someone who had been in charge of public affairs at the Pentagon, who's, uh, I mean, they know it now, so I'll just say he's in charge of public affairs for the Indo-Pacific region right now. Mm -hmm. He's an expert. And I said, so there's a policy that says that it recommends that I submit the text of my forthcoming book for a policy review in the Pentagon that could take up to 30 days. And I had the concern that given the climate and given the fact that I've been talking about this with my chain of command, I've been you've, you've paid writing the 30 complaints. Days. 30 days are gone. And nothing is happening. <clears throat> and I'm afraid that if I submit this, I, it'll probably never see the light of day. I'll mm. never get my text back. Mm -hmm. And so I said, is it a requirement or is it a suggestion? I want to understand. And then he said, based on his experience, uh, it's hit or miss whether or not active duty authors use that process. And it's always suggested that they do, especially if they feel like they're concerned that they're potentially divulging classified information because they participated sure. in Operation X, Y, or Z in sure. Afghanistan. That's not the case. And that was you. totally, right. mine's an academic right. work. Right. So how and, did you learn about your termination? <clears throat> what did they say? I, 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 terminated people um, in business, and, and I know the process. Yeah. Did we always give the person, we say, here's why. Oh, sure. Right? Yeah. We discuss it with them. You know, we gave you this many chances or whatever. What did right. they say to you? What did they say they were firing you for? Well, let, let, me, let me say one more thing, and then I'll answer sure. that question, sure. too. And it's that I also counseled with my base legal office about the publication of that book before I published it. Uh, I, I asked uh, a major who was uh, digging up information for me from Ra Air Force regulations about publications so I could read through it all. And mm -hmm. then I counseled with her for her inter interpretation of my legal obligations. And then I worked with a team of civilian attorneys who helped me sift through the text before I ever published it making sure that I couldn't be, I said, I don't want to defame anyone's character and I don't want to mention anyone's name anywhere in the text that could betray people's identities unless they're public figures like Secretary of Defense or the, and I didn't criticize any of them, by the way, because that's illegal according to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I didn't criticize mm -hmm. one public, mm -hmm. one person in my chain of command in writing or in a podcast. I criticized our approach and our policy. I didn't criticize the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very careful in all of that. Now, having said that, you mentioned the podcast. So I do the podcast, and a week later, it's a Friday afternoon. I went to work that day. By the way, I wrote that book in my free time. I didn't take my time as a commander to write that book. I woke up early. I stayed up late. And outside of my official capacity, uh, outside of uniform with my own pennies and time, I wrote that. And on my weekends, and I spent four months doing that with every spare moment I had, mm -hmm. in addition to being a full-time uh, commander. So when I got called in on, it was May 14th when I was called into my boss's office to hear on the phone the three-star. He's the same one that fielded my IG complaint, my inspector general's complaint that he dismissed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's the same guy that fielded and dismissed that complaint. He was the one that fired me. I can't imagine without the knowledge of every senior leader above him because it's a big decision i mean this is a active duty commander we're going to mm -hmm. fire him and mm -hmm. oh by the way we're going to leak this story to the press which they did mm -hmm. which thrust me and my family into the national spotlight i didn't break that story they did 
He said on the phone that he was re- he, that he had to relieve me of my command. I saw your podcast, the one that you just watched. He says, and the allegation is that you have been politically partisan while acting in an official capacity. That was his, that was the allegation, which I deny to this day. I've never done any such thing. Mm-hmm. On both counts, it wasn't uh, politically uh, uh, biased, and it wasn't uh, uh, in an official capacity. Yeah. Identifying and criticizing Marxist ideology shouldn't be politically partisan. <laughs> you you, you the, think it's part of your job. The fact, yeah, and in fact, we committed uh, hundreds of thousands of lives over the last half century during the Cold War to defeat to that it. very thing. Right. And so the fact that I can say, hey, let me teach you about Marxist ideology and how it fuels the current social justice movement, uh, that was politically partisan, which is telling, by the way. Uh, so <clears throat> I denied that I had been politically partisan. I was fired for it. And then I was informed by the same three star. He said, now we're going to open an investigation. He said he was directing the opening of, of an investigation to determine if I had been politically partisan while acting in an official capacity. The very For the very reason for which I was fired, that was what the investigation. Now we're going to open an investigation. Now we're going to open an investigation. Wouldn't that and, happen the other way around? Right? You'd hope so. Yeah. But the fact is, so I spent three months under investigation, never heard a word from my chain of command and never heard a word from any investigator. The the Department of the uh, Air Force has an inspector general's team, and they shut down that investigation and took the investigation into their own hands, I presume because I was no longer the only person under investigation. Mm. They're looking into what happened over the last several months and who knew about all the of book, this right. and who what was the base commander really up to and did anyone so they start poking around and as i talk to all of the people who are experiencing that discrimination these are senior civilian leaders who have been around a long time uh i won't say their positions because to this day those are still protected they're not i mean they still work there and To this day, and to my knowledge, no one, no investigator has ever asked any of them what was taking place at my base that generated that book. Not a single senior leader. I'm confused. What kind of investigation can it be if they don't talk to the people who are being investigated? That's the, you know, my wife is wise and she's asked the same question a few times. Wait, wait, what kind of an investigation is this where no one's being investigated or asked any questions? So we waited for three months for word from someone about and me, during that period. You're in limbo, and, or you're still oh, lieutenant I was in colonel? Limbo. Oh, I was in, I was a lieutenant colonel <clears throat> on active duty. I'd been relieved of command. I'd been sat in an office and told you're under investigation. Well, three months passed, and and we were hearing nothing. And frankly, this is an easy thing. You look into this for like two hours and decide have I been politically partisan or not. Crack the book open, take a look, and say, you know Listen what? Listen to the podcast, he, whatever. Wh- how about you interview me? Mm-hmm. I've never been asked mm-hmm. a single question by anyone in my chain of command mm-hmm. to this day. And no, I'm no longer active duty. Not a single person sat me down and said, let's talk about this. I know you've expressed concern in the past about the division that's taking place in our mm-hmm. ranks. By the way, I'm going to be pretty bold on this point. Every single one of those leaders in, in the chain of command should be absolutely mortified at the thought that these young people who signed up to defend their country are losing their morale and are losing their desire to serve. They should be ashamed that they've never gone to investigate this because it's not just happening under my supervision. It's happening everywhere. Of course. You've got people who are planning to get out because they're sick of the politicization of our military and it's radical left-wing politicization. If they're good, decent people, and by the way, it's not just conservatives that are fed up with this. It's also the leftist who buys into this narrative who's disgusted at the military because they think if my if my military is filled with radical right-wing white nationalists and I've got a systemically racist country and now he, this he or she believes that, why why would you want to <laughs> put your neck on the line defending that? You don't. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So every, it's a lose-lose situation. And our senior military leaders have now and had the opportunity to absolutely cut that off and say that activism has to stop. And they've never done it because they're aligning themselves with the activists who are in charge of our defense department and in charge of our Matt, administration. It's intentional. And it's a part of a plan. The goal is to destroy <laughs> America. That's right. And to destroy the military is one step in that direction. This is a great step. The purpose, I hated writing the book. I don't like thinking about this ugly stuff all the time. And I hated writing a book. I mean, it's terrible work. And I don't want to ever do it again. But the fact that I did it should, I hope 
and, and frankly, it's been read by hundreds of thousands of people in the past several months. I want every American to know that I 100% am convinced and convicted of the peril our nation faces that's related to all of this junk mm -hmm. that we're talking mm -hmm. about. And that's the very reason I wrote that book. Uh, I wrote that book a week later after it was published. There's a group called Flag Officers for America. Hundreds of admirals and general officers wrote a letter to the nation warning about the Marxist revolution cause that's underway that, that threatens our nation. It's like it's dated May something. I mean, look up Flag Officers for I America. I didn't know that. It was, and we knew nothing of each other. So I wrote my book warning about this. Flag Officers for America, this group, they write a letter to the nation warning of the Marxist revolutionary impulse that's going to destroy our nation. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Mark Levin announced that he had a forthcoming book, American Marxism, that was coming out later in the summer. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, the American people are being warned that this is a terrible, terrible threat. The fact that it's grabbed a hold of our military should frighten everyone in this country. I mean, our military leaders should know better. I mean, they've been around long enough. They know better. They know, they know better. They're just part of the problem now. Yeah, do they do it wittingly? Do they do it unwittingly? And I these always are smart been, people. These are smart people. Right. Our, our senior military leaders, many of them are very good people. They're smart people. They love their country. I'm learning, unfortunately, that many of them aren't willing to speak up about this, either because they're slow to learn about this problem or because they lack courage, perhaps, uh, and they're close to their mm. retirement or something. But Or maybe they think it's a passing no. phase of American history two years from now, or just give it another election, and this is all going to go away, and that's just not right. That's false. It's not going to go away. In fact, if we don't start to get a grip on it now, you're going to lose your country. Otherwise, I wouldn't have written a book. I don't mm -hmm. care that much about books. I don't care that much about right. I, well, actually, that's not true. I'm not speaking carefully now. I don't care that much to spend my time writing a book. Yes, I care yes. a great deal about. Of course, books. of course. People need to be aware. And um, but so, if <clears throat> at your rank, if you were willing to stand up courageously, it takes people of the most senior rank less courage. They have more clout. Um, more difficult to be removed. So the fact that they wouldn't stand up means that they are part of the problem. They were selected. They are. Part they of were the promoted to that level to com to, to to continue uh, to um, uh, to preach what they're preaching and to try to destroy the military, that's what they have control over, which is a part of destroying America. This is intentional. It's not an oversight. It's not because they're not brave. It's because they're evil. There is evil in the world. We've learned this, you know. We've learned uh, it over uh, and maybe, over. <laughs> maybe a baby isn't born, you know, maybe uh, without evil or positives. But when people grow up, you can categorize them. There are good people. There are great people, there are good people, and there are evil people. Mm -hmm. Most people are nothing, I suppose, but that doesn't matter what most people, the average person is average right. in every way, okay? I'll, I'll overstate that. But as long as there are evil people in the world, there need to be good people mm -hmm. who stand up. The famous quote, the, uh, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Right. And... Right now, good men, most of them are, are silent. Are silent. Let me. Let me. I'm going to pounce on you for that one. I'm going to pounce on you for that one. There are. This is the. This is the tough part. That mainstream media. A lot of people get their information from mainstream media. I'm not saying you do. I know so many good people in our. So this is a. This is another message I want to give to the American people. Is that. You have so many courageous, bold, noble, active duty service members. You really do. Most of them don't have a voice. Most I've been written by hundreds of them uh, in, in the past couple of months. Mm -hmm. They all both, first off, thank me, and then start asking questions. Some of them are 21, some of them are 24, mm -hmm. some of them are much older. And they say, I'm just not sure at the moment 
how I, what how and next. when and where I'm supposed to take this courageous stand. That's right. And whether or not the timing is right to make the most impact. That's right. And so there, there, there are good people really wrestling. To your point, there's great men, there's good men, there's great women, there's good women. And they're trying to wrestle through this dynamic environment that they find themselves in and, and figuring out what's my hill to die on. When do I take my stand? Do I really want to take it over this COVID vaccine mandate? Mm-hmm. Is it over mm-hmm. critical race theory? Or is there some, do I stay in, stick it out, and try and be a voice of courage within the services? Because heaven forbid all the good people leave our armed forces and our police forces. Uh, so the reason I say I'm going to pounce on you uh, for that is that I want to convey the idea that we do have many courageous men and women. There's a reason they sign up in an all-voluntary force to defend this. It's because they love our country. Mm-hmm. But they're learning right now how to be bold. They're learning how to be. Mm-hmm. And there are many who are that we will never hear about. And uh, I just, I'm fortunate enough to get to hear from some of them. And uh, I shouldn't, I would be careful how I say this. There is a high ranking female officer in one of the services who works for a very important person in the services uh, who is high profile who's written to me and is about to go public because she's being purged and pushed out because she's a conservative Christian and is taking a stand against this within her own organization. And whereas up until this point, she's been kind of a a shiny object and a high performing officer, she's about to be purged and she's about to go public. And, and I, I'm really grateful when people like her go public because these, there, there are hundreds of thousands of our young service members that need to see that. They need to see, they're going to start to get the clue that there's a pro- big problem. But unfortunately, way. going public isn't as easy as it used to be. Not only are there consequences, as you found, of going public, you lose your job, but uh, it, it's difficult to communicate to the public because the grip it that is. big tech has on the microphone that we're all supposed to be able to use. Yeah, all of the people contemplating going public, whether they're a captain or a lieutenant colonel or even higher ranks, are, know that they're potentially throwing their pension in the trash. Uh, that's a hard decision to make. You've got a family to, t- to feed. Uh, I had this, I, I mean, we just did this. I requested an early retirement and it was denied. Denied? It was denied. I mean, the, my understanding, there's a congressionally approved program called TERRA, the, the Early Retirement uh, Program. I don't know what the A stands for. It was within the uh, Secretary of the Air Force's authority, it seemed to me, to to grant that retirement. And instead, it separated me without a without a pension. Uh, there are many other people in this boat right now, whether it's over the COVID vaccine or any other number of stands that they're taking at the moment in the face of a totalitarian impulse. They're recognizing what's afoot, and they're putting their foot down and saying, not me, not my generation, and not for my children. We've seen this play out in history. It ends very, very poorly unless people speak up early mm-hmm. and often. So what is the next step for you? What's the next chapter in your, what's the first chapter in your next book? Right. I hope I never write one, but I'm writing the real life book right now and um, what that is for me. So currently I'm the executive director for an organization called the Committee to Support and Defend. Mm-hmm. It's a project of the American Constitutional Rights Union, and I just accepted the the job a couple of weeks ago actually where's it based well it's uh so it's based out of virginia Mm -hmm. uh but uh lori roman who's the president of the acru has been active for a long time this particular project the committee to support and defend was chaired originally by lieutenant colonel retired alan west who's now running for the governor of texas and so they asked yeah they asked if i would uh, take that spot uh from him uh, and uh, there was another retired Colonel Frank Bragg who was, who was doing that temporarily in the interim. Mm-hmm. And so my purpose, you know, the purpose of that is to mobilize veterans in defense of liberty so they can continue to keep their oath. And one of the largest, most important groups of people in this country who feel like they don't have a voice at the moment is our active duty service member. Mm-hmm. And so in addition to mobilizing our veterans in the cause of liberty, trying to communicate going forward to our active duty service member, that they in fact do have committees and organizations, groups of people that uh, are listening very carefully and are trying to give them a voice as well. And uh, so in addition to that, I'm a Newsmax TV contributor. 
I'll, so I'll be on Newsmax a few times a week. Uh, and I, I hope go, paid. It's uh, yeah, I'm under contract with Newsmax mm. uh, for, Great. for a season. Great. And uh, so you find you you forge your way in the world when you you know you get out and you you figure out what to do. But my my entire drive is to continue to keep my oath to support and defend the Constitution. There's no more important time in American history to do it than right now. And so that committee to support and defend peace, and I'll just say the website is committee to support and defend dot org, mm-hmm. and people can go there and, and see what we're doing, and they can they can sign up and join the team and and start to support that effort. And I'm going around the country and speaking right now, uh, and and I've got a very particular message I'm trying to get out for the next four to six months to the American people, and I've got a lot of opportunities lined up from the West Coast to the East Coast. And, uh, and I've, I've been a number of places just in the past several weeks sharing that message. And, I, and I'll say it here as well. I want every American to understand that we've got the God-given right and ability to speak our mind and speak what's in our hearts. We've got a constitutional amendment that protects that right. And people are losing their, their faith or their hope in the idea of the power of an individual's voice, and they shouldn't. They need to understand that their voice matters a great deal. In whatever sphere of influence they happen to be situated in, they can make a tremendous difference by using that voice. And it's the only thing, frankly, really, when it comes down to basic principles that they've got left. Because beyond your voice is violence. And and we don't want to get we don't want to go there. I mean, the reason we we prize and cherish free speech so much is because it is the peaceful mechanism that we have in the society to you know, good luck uh, discussing with a left-wing ideologue, of mm-hmm. course, but free speech is the mechanism available to us to peacefully resolve our differences. And that's all being shut down at the moment. You need to take a stand against that. You need to speak boldly and you can make a difference. And in fact, one person's voice can make a great difference. But I believe free speech can only exist as long as we have the Second Amendment, Mm. which is the right to bear arms. Because if without arms, then uh, the vast majority of people or whoever they are, uh, take control Mm. and eliminate the freedoms that we now have. So while the First Amendment is so important, uh, it's like saying, what's the most important part of a car? (laughs) Well, people say the engine. We'll try to run without the wheels. Mm -hmm. We need both. And countries where people's weapons were taken away, where it was illegal, their speech soon followed. That's right. Well, that's why there's an effort underway to start to limit and restrict our access to weapons. Uh, This is, you've, you've, you've said this already in the interview, this is a part of a plan. Uh, a very methodical plan. It's a long-term plan. It's been underway for a long, long time. There have always been people that have hated this country, but they've never ultimately been very successful in this country because Americans writ large loved their country. And ever since really the 1930s, I write about this in the book, but you you had Marxist, you had the Frankfurt School, uh, some individuals from the Frankfurt School flee Hitler's Third Reich and they came over to Columbia University and other universities. They're at the Teachers College and they're pushing what is called the critical school of thought. And since then, there's been an effort underway to divorce the American people from our founding principles. If you can get the American people to stop at a fundamental, at a core level, associating with those values, the Judeo-Christian value. Right, the values of faith, family, freedom. That's right, yeah. At 100, get people to, to not believe in those things anymore. Mm-hmm. And then you can get them to break up into tribes, correct? Uh, and and start the unifying to hate factor one is the Constitution. It is the family and the belief in God. Those are the unifying factors that have been in place in America since its founding, and those are the things that are under attack today. I completely agree, and I've I've been studying our founding, and uh, in fact, just read a great book about Thomas Jefferson. But these are these are terrific men. They, they cared a great deal Brilliant. about those things in a way that many Americans, unfortunately, today have lost no r- idea. touch with. Thank but you. these were marvelous uh, men. They deserve our everlasting thanks, gratitude, and we're ungrateful people at the moment. And, and frankly, we're, we're subject to a 
I'll, I'll put it this way. <clears throat> this won't necessarily resonate with every listener, but God fills up an, an important, a fundamental role in, in a Judeo-Christian based society, of course, naturally, in, in American society. And God has been stripped from the hearts and minds of men. And when that happens, the vacuum that is left is, is susceptible to be replaced by, a Marxist ideology is a very powerful thought. I was quick to dismiss it at first, but the more I think about it, it's, it's exceptionally powerful. I mean, it's like, it's like a religion. It teaches you who the good guys are, who the bad guys are. It teaches you how to gain salvation. Uh, it teaches you, in fact, that in order to bring about utopia or paradise on this earth, you need to sacrifice other humans and their tribes and their identity. You need to, you need to throw down the oppressor and you need to replace that oppressor with a more just and virtuous society. And man's nature can finally blossom. We'll cease to have war on the earth. And mm-hmm. you'll, you'll usher in a heavenly utopia, the utopian state. Uh, it's utterly at odds with Christianity or the Judeo-Christian principle, in fact, which teaches a man that he needs to sacrifice and change himself in order both to inherit a better afterlife, but also to serve others. Mm-hmm. And Marxist, Marxism flips that on its head and it demonizes those around them and it, it gets people to hate others in a way that allows them to think that it's actually necessary to sacrifice them. It's evil, uh, to your point. And it, and it makes evil of people. And so what you see at the moment, this fracturing, this polarization that's occurring, there's no, any number of words you could use to describe what we see taking place in American society at the moment and unfortunately in our armed forces is that people lose touch with America and what it originally meant and was intended to mean, and they start grabbing a hold of anything that starts to provide them meaning and purpose in this world. And being able to define the evil other, the evil oppressor, is a very powerful medicine. And uh, I'm concerned if we don't, if we don't get a, a grip on this right now and start to restore our belief in the family and our faith... I, I, I touch on that delicately, by the way, in the book. And not everyone's Christian, and you don't have to be to be American. I say, if you're a Christian, then turn to the, the God of Christianity. Turn to Christ. If you're a Jew, turn to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and repent. If you're an atheist or you're not a believer, then turn to America's founding principles, at very least, because that's what unifies us as a country, as a people, regardless of their religion, regardless of their political affiliation. It's supposed to be that way. We need to turn to that. If we don't, we'll lose our country. How about that for a happy message? <laughs> it's not a happy message. Well, thank you for the message, Matthew. Yeah. And there are different forms of courage. There is the courage of a combat soldier, airman, or sailor who knowingly faces the possibility of death when he enters combat. But in doing so, he achieves victory for his country. There is the courage of an individual who stands up for what's right like Rosa Parks, who back in 1955 got on a bus in segregated Montgomery, Alabama, and was arrested when she refused to give up her seat to a white man. That courageous act led, after many lawsuits and appeals, to the Supreme Court, which found in November of 1956 that bus segregation was unconstitutional. There is the courage of three young men Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney, who in 1964 traveled from the safety of their homes to provide moral support to members of a black community in Longdale, Mississippi, where they were arrested, later released, and then murdered by a racist mob for their noble efforts. But they didn't die in vain. The murders were the catalyst for change and for the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And then there's the courage of people like Matthew Lohmeyer, who stand up and speak up when he saw serious wrongs in his organization and in the community and now in our society. And he spoke up despite the knowledge of the resulting intense backlash that he will surely face, including, in his case, of being terminated from his position 
having his character besmirched, having his future damaged, and even having his pension that he had earned taken away. Let the other examples of courage that I've just described. I'm hopeful that Matthew, his act of defiance, will also be successful in helping cure the ills that are affecting our society today. Matthew, it is truly an honor to meet you. Thank you so much for joining me today, and thank you so much more for your courage, for standing up and doing everything that you can to expose the evil virus of Marxism that has entered the bloodstream of America. God bless you, and may you continue to stand up as an example for many others to follow in this battle to save America's soul. Happy to be here with you. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. If you enjoy these interviews with some of today's most influential thought leaders, please follow and rate the show on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget, you can also watch each episode on YouTube as well. We'll see you next time.